Hey everyone, this is Pastor Andrew, and today we are going to be going over Psalm 14. So like the last few Psalms, this is a Psalm of David, and we're going to see a contrast between two things. We're going to see a contrast between the fool, someone who is unwise in what they do, and then we're going to see the perspective of God and the perspective of the righteous. So we have this we have this contrast between these two, and so this is what we're going to see in this psalm today. So if you look below, we have this maps document here. And so I'm going to read the psalm, and then I want you to take 10 minutes just to read over yourself. Click the link that's below, and you'll see the maps document. And I want you to just do this for yourself really quick, and then we'll come back. So I'm going to read the psalm, and then I want you to just pause it and take, take 10 minutes. So here's Psalm 14. To the choir master of David. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together, they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have there no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. Okay, yeah, so just take take a few minutes to look below here at the at the document, pause it, and come back in just a bit. Okay, glad you did that. And so I'm going to fill out um, what I saw for when I was going through this psalm. So writing down the point of the passage, uh, to me, the point of the passage is that, you know, there is none who do good. Not even one. So basically we see in this passage that not even one person is good and that everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. And so uh, in this apply section, how does this passage to transform the way you think, desire, and act. So I think for the way I think, it would be, you know, I'm, I'm not the only one. So I'm not the only one who sees all the things that are wrong with our world and all the things that are just they're going wrong and I don't understand why. Like, I'm not the only one who's, who sees all the things that are going wrong. Um, desire, I think a good desire, um, for me at least, is just, you know, you know, I want more justice in the world. Like there are so many things that are wrong in the world. Like um, just seeing all the demonstrations for George Floyd and the protest and all the um, all the injustice that so many people have taken a part of. And you know, I just I want more justice. I want I want to see justice serve. Like that that even though the only time we're really going to see all justice is when Jesus comes back. I want to see this more. And then the way I act, I think I, you can know, you can be an advocate for those who are hurting. So an advocate is basically someone who speaks out for someone who can't. And so your voice is a powerful thing and speaking out for those who are hurting and for those who maybe can't speak for themselves really does make a difference. So in this next section, pray, uh, I think really when you write down a prayer based on this passage, it should do one of four things, maybe more. It should either lead you to, you know, praise, repent, ask, or yield, or all four. I think for me, the biggest one I see is ask. And, you know, I think for me, it would be like, I'd ask God, you know, show me. Oh, that's a W. Show me my sinfulness. So show me how sinful I am and how much that I need Christ. And then share one way you could share this. I think you could that you could just show like, hey, you know, there is no one who is good. And you could point people to this passage. So there's no one who is good. And one of the pass one verse that I think I might write down is verse three here, where it says, you know, they have all turned aside. Together they have all, they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. I think that's a great verse there to share. So let's look at the passage here. So again, this is Psalm 14. And so right here we have to the choir master of David. Again, this is going to be in Hebrew. So this is going to be in the text. Basically, it's it's a writing of David. 
It's he he wrote it. It's a song to be sung by people, and it's to the choir master. So in the sense, he's writing it so that someone could sing it to a group. So let's start. The fool says in his heart, "There is no God." They, the fools, are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. So looking at verse one, it's, we're talking about the fool here. So the fool says in his heart, and when it says heart, it means that this is like the center of his being. So when he says it is from his heart, he really means this. And he says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So what, what's being described here is what we know as an atheist, someone who believes that there basically is no God. Uh, there's a quote from um, the pastor that I wrote in, in preparing for this, and it was interesting. He said, you know, there are a lot of atheists on earth, but there are no atheist in hell. So basically what he was saying is like everyone at one one day is going to have to come face to face to the fact that there is a God and that he does require something of us. And so there, while there may be atheists on earth, there are no atheists in hell because we know and, and same thing with heaven. There's no atheists in heaven as well because everyone ultimately knows that there is a creator. There is someone who made all things. So talking about these evil people, it says they are corrupt and they do abominable deeds. So this is basically they're doing things that are wicked. They're doing things that are evil. They're doing things that they know is wrong, but they've suppressed the truth. So let's say they're called to honor their father and mother. Instead of doing that, they just go off and basically do whatever they want they're, they know what they're doing is wrong but they're basically saying you know what it doesn't really matter what I do because like like who cares like it doesn't really matter and ultimately this is th- this is why they're corrupt because in their heart they're saying there is no God and from the heart of saying that it makes them corrupt and it makes them do these abominable deeds and then we have this phrase you know there is none who does good so this reminds me a lot of Romans 3.23. That was a bad three there. (laughs) So it's Romans 3.23, and it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So basically what it's saying is like, there is none who does good on the earth. So basically God is sitting there and he's like, like, what's going on? Like, why is why there's so many sinful people on earth. And at at this time, like Jesus had not physically come to earth um, in the form of a man. And so he's looking at all of creation and saying like, there's no one here who has been completely righteous and completely holy. And so many of these fools in their heart, like in their innermost being are saying there is no God. So there's just a lot of injustice. There's a lot of things that are going wrong in in the world. And so we've got the Lord, you know, looking down from heaven on the children of man. So he's looking down on everyone. And you have to understand this is this is a basically a way that they're saying, hey, you know, he's God is looking down on heaven, but really like God sees everything. So he knows everything that is going on. So when it's saying that he's looking down from heaven, it doesn't mean he's physically in you know the the clouds and he's physically looking down like he understands everything but it's a way that we can understand what what god's doing there and so he's looking down there to see there are any who understand and any who really seek after god so he's looking basically at everyone here and he's asking hey does anyone love god is there anyone who does not fall short of of god and so it's it's like if you ever read the book of isaiah there's this great chapter, Isaiah 6, where it talks about um, God is looking down on the whole earth and he's saying, all right, you know, who, who's going to go for me? Who's going to share my message? And Isaiah stands up and he says, you know, here I am, you know, send me. And so what he's saying there is like, I know that I'm not righteous. I know that I'm not holy, but God, if you need a messenger, like send me, I'll go. 
And so God is looking down from heaven on us and he's trying to see if anyone is righteous. And it's almost like this little meme that I found. It's like, you know, God's here like, okay, you know, is there, is there any that are righteous? You know, closes his eyes and is like, oh, well, there's no one who's righteous. And he's just looking down at us and he's like, oh man, there's nobody who is righteous. Like, like what are they doing? <laughs> Anyways. So again, we're talking about the evil here so that, you know, they have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. We'll come back to this, but not even one is good. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people. So the evildoers are eating up God's people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. So looking back at verse three, it says, you know, so all these evil people have turned aside and together they become become corrupt. So this is a little bit. So verses three through about six is really God's perspective. Um, so if we can look back at this meme here, <laughs> basically this is this is you know God's perspective of of what's going on in the world. He's just like, dude, what what's going on? Like what's happening? And so. We're looking at this and he says, you know, all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. And basically there is no one who does good, not even one. So everyone on the earth is evil. And everyone on the earth has fall, fallen short of the glory of God. Like one way that this it's easy to understand is like, okay, you know, have you ever – like have you ever gotten mad at someone? And you could say, well, yeah, I've been mad. And then you could say, okay, well, has that anger – ever been would you wouldn't say it's a righteous anger it's been an unrighteous anger and you would probably say well well yeah and like okay well in the in the bible it says that if you've if you've ever even been angry at someone unrighteously that you're you're guilty of murder and then you may also say like okay you know have you ever had like have you ever stolen anything and then you could say well i mean you know maybe i've stolen like a few packs of gum from the from the candy grocery store and you're like, okay, well then, then in that sense, you're a thief. And so like, you know, you're in the Bible's eyes, you're a murderer, you know, in the Bible's eyes, you're a thief. And even if you've repented of this and maybe you've even like been punished for this, ultimately you cannot say that, oh, you know, I'm wholly good. No, like really, if you've done those things, you're not good. And so that's what God is saying here. He's saying, you know, there's none who does good, not even one. Everyone on earth, as much as they try to do good things, as much as we try to do good things, we always fall short of God's glory in a sense. We always fall short of God's perfect standard. Like if God wants us to be perfect, we simply just – we can't do it. We can't live up to that standard. And so looking, looking at this next section, it says, you know, have they no knowledge, all these evildoers who eat up my people – as they eat bread. So this is basically, you know, they're, they're consuming evil. And again, this is, this is a metaphor. So it's, it's, it's not talking about physically eating people, but he's like, Hey, you know, they're eating this bread as fast up as they're just like eating up the righteous people and they don't call upon the Lord. So one of the things we know about Christians is that if you're a Christian and you sin, what you do after you sin is you repent and you ask forgiveness so in this sense, when you're repenting and asking forgiveness, what you're doing is you're saying, hey, you know, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? And I won't do it again. That's what it is. But if you're not a, if you're not a Christian, this, this whole, you know, repent, ask forgiveness thing, like that's not on, that's not in your vocabulary. And yeah, you might, you might apologize, but some of the time you're just like, well, why did I do anything wrong? Like, okay, you know, I, you know, I, I thought bad, like I, I was really mad at my brother, but I never did anything. So I'm fine, you know, or, oh, you know, I stole candy, but, but nobody ever saw me do it. It like, it, it didn't hurt anybody. But really what, what God is saying there is that if we sin, we need to repent. We need to turn and ask forgiveness. And the way that we ask forgiveness is one, to ask for the person that we wronged for forgiveness. But two, we call upon the Lord. We say, God, you know, I, I, I'm not good enough to 
have salvation. I'm not good enough to merit your salvation. God, you're going to need to save me. You're going to need to come in and, and help me. So from God's perspective here, it's, it's like this is a little photo of Nick Young. I don't know if you know who Nick Young is. He was a player for the, the Lakers, Los Angeles Lakers, and then the Golden State Warriors. And then this is, again, kind of God's perspective. He's like, he's like looking at us, and then he's like, like what just happened, dude? Like, like, what are you doing? Like, why is everyone corrupt? Like, why is everyone turning aside? Like, don't you know what it means to be righteous? And God has a standard, and, you know, we fail. We don't, <laughs> we don't hit the mark. And so looking at verses 5, it says, you know, they, there they are in great terror. This is the evil ones. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You would put, would shame the plans of the poor. But the Lord is his refuge. The Lord is the refuge of the poor. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, then let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. So this is the last three verses of the passage. And looking at this, the first thing, God's, again, God's perspective here. So we got verses five and six. We got more of God's perspective. It says, you know, they are in great terror for God is with the generation of the righteous. So again, when you do evil things, when you do things that you know you're not right, you don't like, it's, it's hard to sleep at night because you know that ultimately your evil deeds will catch up to you. Like, you know that, hey, if I'm doing things that are wrong, ultimately it's going to catch up to me. It's like if you're thinking about, okay, you know, I want to have a godly spouse when I, when I get older, when I get married. One of the things that you need to know is like if you're trying to find a godly spouse, first you don't need to find the right person. You need to be the right person. In that sense, like, if you're the right person in the sense of you follow after God, you care about what he wants, you care about his his thoughts and you care about his actions, like you're going to attract someone who also thinks that way. But if you don't like want what God wants, you don't care about his actions, you don't care about reading his word, you don't care about all these things, you're not going to attract someone who also cares about that. You're you're going to attract really what you are. And Jesus says this in a few parables. One of the big ones that he talks about is talk, he talks about a tree. So he talks about this tree and he says, Hey, you know, a tree has fruit. So we're going to draw a tree with two sides. So he has tree. One tree has good fruit. This is the red fruit. Then one tree has bad fruit. It's the purple fruit. And so he's like, one tree cannot produce both good fruit and bad fruit. It's either going to produce all good fruit or it's going to produce all bad fruit. It's not going to produce both. So in that sense, if we're good, we're going to be wholly good and we're going to produce good fruit. But if we're bad and we're wholly bad, we're going to produce bad fruit. And in that same way, when you think about attracting a spouse or trying to find someone to marry, you're going to attract what you already are. So you don't need to find the right person. You need to become the right person, then the right, and then the right person will come to you. And just as you continue to grow in your walk, you're going to see that this is more, more and more true. Like good people that like, there are no good people, but the, the Christians, they're going to produce good fruit, but the non-Christians are going to produce bad fruit. And you can really see who, who people are by the fruit they produce. And, and basically by fruit, what I mean here is their actions. So, okay. You know, you're a Christian, and you, you're really trying to please God and you're trying to, so you're really involved in the church. Maybe you like teach a Sunday school lesson, or maybe you, you ask people how you can pray for them and you do it and you go and do it. But, or, you know, if you're producing bad fruit, like you just, you're really hard to deal with all the time, or you don't, you're really argumentative with people and you're not honoring your father and mother. And when people ask you to do stuff, you either lie to them, you don't tell them the truth. Like that's, again, it's, it's producing good or bad fruit. So looking at, go back to verse five, it says, you know, they're in great terror for God is with the generation of the righteous. So God always puts himself in the camp of the righteous, but he also puts himself in the camp of the poor. So God is a God of the oppressed and he's a God of the hurting. So what he, what it means by that is 
it's, it says, you know, you would shame the plans of the poor. So God, he cares for the poor. And that's why it says that God is the refuge of the poor because he cares for them and he loves them. He loves all people, but especially those who are hurting, who maybe can't speak out for themselves. God is the God of the poor and he's a God of the oppressed and he, he cares for all these people. And then coming to verse seven, I think it's just this beautiful conclusion to the passage. It says, oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. So David right here, he has a hope that salvation is going to come out of Zion. And while David never physically met the person of Jesus, that is who he was looking for. David was looking for the person of Jesus when salvation would for Israel would come out of Zion. So when Jesus came, he came to save those who were, who were Jewish. He came to save the people of Israel, and the people of Israel rejected him. So because the people of Israel rejected Jesus, Jesus said, okay, you know, salvation is not only now for Israel, but it's also for the Gentiles. He's, it's also for, for, the, for the people who aren't Jewish. It's for all people. And God has always been a God who is reaching out to the lost. He's reaching out to those who don't, who aren't necessarily in the camp. So God's always been reaching out to those who are the oppressed, you know, the poor, the hurting, and he cares about them. And so when Jesus died on the cross and then three days later rose out of the grave, what he was saying is that, hey, salvation now is for Israel, but it's also for everyone else. And says, when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, this is kind of looking in this sense to heaven when all things will be made right and we and God will dwell with his people forever. That's why the name of Jesus, it means Emmanuel, which means basically God with us. So when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people and he comes and dwells with us, that's what he's doing. And it says, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. So the first three patriarchs, basically like really great men we find in the Bible, are Abraham, you find this in Genesis 12, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is, and so when it, whenever it says, you know, let Jacob rejoice, it's kind of saying, all right, a great patriarch, let Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob rejoice. And then also let the, let the people of Israel be glad because there is a salvation for Israel that's coming out of Zion and it's coming in a way that people can see. And it's coming in a way that while there's still a lot of things wrong in the world and there's a lot of things that we don't understand and we don't know why it's going on, we can know that God is going to restore all things to himself. He's going to restore the fortunes of Israel and he's going to restore the the wrong and the broken things of this world just with the power of his word and with the power of his actions. And he's going to show all people that he cares for them and that he is a God of the oppressed. But ultimately that oppression is going to end when God comes and he brings justice like the roaring of a waterfall down upon all people. I pray this was an encouragement to you. I pray that you enjoyed this this, and enjoyed just reading it for yourself and looking at that, that maps document. So let me pray for you. Lord, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I pray for whoever's watching that you would be blessing them. Lord, that you would be showing them more of yourself each and every day and that you would allow yourself just to be glorified in their life and in all that they do. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.